Methodist Church. We're off to a good start, right? Yeah. Thanks for hanging in there. We're trying to double play on the uh, opening lighting of the candles. We have an educational moment. You like educational moments? So around here, we're planned, not scripted, right? Right, which means you always have to be prepared when something goes wrong, right? How many know that's a good plan for life? Any Boy Scouts? Be prepared, right? Okay, so a little education. One, Kurt ran to the back to get the extra candle lighter. There's always one tucked usually behind the plants. <laughs> or inside our cabinet here in the back. So, for all of our acolytes, emergency acolyte training, right? We now know where the backup plan is. Um, and uh, the presence of God as represented by those candles are lit and with us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Please join me. Oh, before we do the call to worship, welcome and announcements. I fail to include the most important announcement. You ready for this? The community breakfast is next Saturday, uh, 8.30 to 10. For those who are prepping, 7.30, how time do you start? We start prepping at 7.30. 7.30, and it's French toast? French toast. French toast, per request from our pickleball patrons. <laughs> and Gary. And Gary. All right. Thank you. Inside and out, we take requests and we do our best to fulfill what God has called us to. We don't do a study there. But we don't, do, don't get too fancy fancy. We'll just say that. Okay, go ahead, Miss Benedict. Um, we'll go with that. Anyway, uh, so Staff Parish will be meeting after the breakfast uh, with our district superintendent next Saturday. And then the following Monday will be our Ad Council. Typically, it would be tomorrow or at least one week. Um, since we're talking with the superintendent, in case we learn something that should be discussed, we'll already be gathered. Does that make sense? All right. Please join me for the call to worship. Tell the Lord's salvation from day to day. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Declare the Lord's glory among the nations. For great is the Lord, and great is to be praised. The Lord made the heavens. The splendor and majesty of the earth are before us. Amen.
We are continuing our journey through Chronicles. Chronicles 10. Saul died because he wasn't faithful to the Lord. He didn't obey the word of the Lord. He even asked for advice from a person who gets messages from people who have died. He didn't ask the Lord for advice. So the Lord put him to death. He turned the kingdom over to David. David was the son of Jesse. The word of God for the people of God. Um, the Ike family had a uh, issue with Calvin this week, uh, a slight stroke, so Calvin's in the hospital. He's home now. No, he's still in the hospital. Okay. Um, tomorrow is 9-11, so we should remember those thousands lost in 9-11. Um, there was a, a uh, large earthquake in Morocco that resulted in, uh, I think we heard a thousand deaths. It was quite startling by any die. Um, and then this is the time of year when East Ohio Conference is um, rearranging people and moving people around. And because of the change in the, the composition of the conference, that's even a bigger issue this year. So with East Ohio, the, our captain, <clears throat> the bishop, and the whole superintendents were on a retreat this week. They're going from eight or ten districts down to four districts for here in East Ohio. So um, each, they're going to come up with a proposal for next annual conference. And so this, this next appointment year, which doesn't, doesn't begin until July 1st, which I know feels a long time away, <laughs> uh, most districts, will, my guess is, will end up with somewhere between 120 and 150 churches or something like that and much greater geography and so there's some significant reorganization happening within our conference and so as they um, discern that, uh, that just hold them in prayer was the request from the bishop and I uh, like to follow through on request for prayer. Amen? Amen. Alright, please join me in the posture of prayer. Loving and holy God, we gather this morning to rejoice in you and your presence, to be reminded of what you have provided for us. We also lift up the concerns of our hearts, our souls, and our minds for loved ones who have encountered illness, for those who are seeking your care, for those impacted by a natural disaster, and for those impacted by the traumatic events of more than 20 years ago here in the United States. Lord, there are always consequences for actions. Some bring blessings, some bring curses. In some moments we are filled with joy, in others we are filled with mourning and despair with seasons of anger, resentment, and feeling empty, or feeling in a way that words cannot describe. And yet we know you are there with us. We know you are our strength, our provider, our redeemer, our hope, and our salvation. And so, in whatever way that we came here this morning, with whatever burdens and cares and joys we have in our heart, we bring them to you. Just as those of generations past have done, and the generations that will follow us will also do. We unite in this moment with those words that your Son Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and 
on the altar to remind me to do it this week, and I showed up, and thank you for whoever did this for me. But this is probably the verse that if our, our, the chronicler, the one who was writing chronicles, was to point to something in the New Testament, this would be it. I can do everything through him, through Christ, through God, who gives me strength. And I'm, as we as I think about chronicles, especially today's message is around King Saul. And we talked about last week how chronicles was written later than kings. It was also written later than Samuel. I forgot to mention that last week. First and second Samuel talk about um, King Saul and then King David and then kings picks up with Solomon and then all the kings of Israel and Judah until the end of the monarch. Okay, and so King Saul in, in the books of in the book of Samuel gets like twenty chapters, and King Saul is a really complicated figure. He's anointed because he's the one that looks and will be the first king of Israel. And sometimes it's with great courage and boldness and obedience, and other times it's not so much. There's a little fear. Like how many remember the story of David and Goliath? Right? We go, who ends up beating Goliath? The 12-year-old. Who was the one not fighting Goliath? King Saul. Right? This is the context. This is the differences. Right? And then in the, in, the, in, the, in the liturgy, in the scripture this morning, so anyways, so this is in Kings and Samuel, there's all this complicated back and forth with Saul. And then in Chronicles, King Saul gets one chapter only 14 verses. And it is really, really, really clear that the chronicler has zero use for Saul. All Chronicles tells about is his death. He had led the people of Israel into a war on his own terms and found himself on the hill where he witnessed the slaughter and death of all of his sons and then asked his armor bearer to kill him. His armor bearer freaked out and didn't do it. So Saul commits suicide on the hill. The armor bearer then commits suicide on the hill. And the next part is the next day, the Philistines, the enemy, comes and they once people are dead on the battlefield, do they have any use for their stuff? No. What's a great way to get free stuff? Right? The dead people on the battlefield. That's what the Philistines come in and they find Saul and his son. And they strip him of his, their armor. They strip them of their heads. And they send parts and pieces across the land to celebrate. And this was what you heard. God's response. So this all happened to Saul because he wasn't faithful. He deserved this. That's harsh, right? He didn't obey the word of the Lord. He even asked the medium. Do you remember this story? We did this a couple of years ago as a play. We had a couple of the, the kids up here. We had one is King Saul was visiting a witch or a medium or a spiritualist. And Saul asked to speak to the ghost of Samuel, the prophet. Samuel was dead, and it was only after Samuel was dead that Paul decided it would be a good idea to check in with God. So he goes to the witch, and the ghost of Samuel speaks to him, and this is like straight out of Charles Dickens and a Christmas Carol, right? Where the Marley brothers come and tell Ebenezer, you're in trouble, right? Except for the Marley brothers had better news than what Samuel gave to Saul. You're done, dude. Too late. And that's what sets up this scene. And that's what the chronicle proclaims as the core of Israel's problems. They tried to figure it out themselves. They acted in fear. They called on everybody's, other, all the other gods. 
and tried to do everything they could to figure out how to do this on their own. See, the problem with monarchy is the problem with politicians is they do it for their own interest, for their own gain, for their own power, for their own control. That's what politics is. That's what wars come down to. Right? If you read the current headlines, right? Russia didn't invade Ukraine because it was a festive time and they wanted to celebrate. It's time for revenge. It's time for punishment. It's time to get rid of those people. It gives us a bridge to the, to the sea. It's better for commerce. It's better for power. It's, it all comes down to that. And that's the critique of the Chronicle. And what we'll see in two weeks when we talk, the Chronicle has a much different picture of David. The 12 year old boy looking at the eight foot giant of a man on the battlefield says, I can do everything through God who gives me strength. The boy who played a harp and a lyre to give comfort to the king. And then the king threw a spear at him, just missed putting him to death. And so he flees. And he's chased for a decade. And all the time, even in exile in his own homeland, many of the psalms that we have, the psalms of David that are preserved, reflect on. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. In David's greatest failings, he repents with a sincere heart. He accepts the consequences of his actions. And he is reminded that I can do everything through him who gives me strength. When our leaders lead from a place of care and compassion, we are leading the way God would have us lead. The way I often say this is that when politics and the gospel get entangled with each other, politics wins. No one hears the gospel. <laughs> why it is so important, so important to lead with a care and a compassion and a genuine concern for other people. Care of their mind, their body, and their soul. Because that communicates the gospel. People can feel and experience the gospel by the way we allow the love and the grace of God to flow through us. In each and every moment of our lives. That's the church at its best. It's the church at its best. I remember, at a, I remember when there was a seminar or a former pastor who once told me The church is the only organization on earth that does not exist for the benefits of its members. <coughs> it exists to strengthen our members for the benefit of our community and the world. So that to the ends of the earth, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess and rejoice in knowing that they can do everything through Christ who gives them strength. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Loving and holy God, you have created us in your image. While at times that image feels
very tarnished or a poor reflection through the gifts of your Son, Jesus Christ, through the power of your Holy Spirit, and through your very presence in all of creation, you have given us the strength we need, and all things are possible, that one day the prayer that we speak in unity each week, your kingdom and your will will be done here on earth as it is in heaven, that all will come to you and rejoice in a sense of peace and praise and joy, a world with no more death, with no more suffering, with no more mourning. This is what you have called us to create. This is who, what you have called us to be. Lord, let our lives be a living witness to you in whatever form we have with whomever we are with. May they know your love, your grace, your peace, and your presence through the life that you have gifted to us. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. At this time, we have an opportunity to give of our tithes and our offerings. Please rise as we sing the doxology together. <laughs>